welcome you to another SIEM sem seminar. My name is Dr. Christiane Schulz and uh, you are listening to me here from uh, Australia. Um, first, in a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, so this, this meeting will be recorded. If you are not okay with being recorded, you have to leave in this uh, meeting now. Um, questions uh, can be asked in the Q&A section uh, here on uh, Teams. Um, these questions will be visible for everyone and will be uh, live immediately. People will also see your name, yeah, just that you know uh, when you ask questions. Um, I believe that we have in view really picking the audience here today. Um, everyone in wants to hear from Arkadi what he has to say in terms of uh, laser metal deposition, trends in technology, materials and uh, applications. Um, Dr. Akadi Zikin has a master's degree from the University of uh, Tallinn in Estonia. He went then on to do his PhD together with uh, AC2T in Vienna, in Austria. That is the Austrian Excellence Center for Tribology. And uh, since 2015, he has been working for Early Mitko first in a few in different positions, and since 2019, he's in charge of the Laser Center of uh, Competence. Without further ado, I'm giving over to Akadin for his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, good day, everyone, or good day time for everybody, because I believe uh, we have people from different locations around the world. I'm um, very well welcome from my side. For me, it will be an early morning session. I'm quite grateful and thankful to Sims for giving me the opportunity to give you a lecture on direction of laser metal deposition. So I believe we can start right now. I hope it will be also interesting for you and let's see if my slides properly work. There was a nice introduction about me, but uh, what I would like to mark also from my side additionally, if um, you want to get more in, in touch with me and also understand what I'm trying to do and push, um, I have two social media channels, one on YouTube, which is called Technologies with Arcadia, and another one on LinkedIn. Um, so please connect with me, feel free to ask me questions and interact if you are still not doing this. We'll be happy to have also technical discussions. Now, if we look on my slides agenda, well, I would like to start uh, giving a brief introduction on what we are doing in Center of Competence, uh, considering also early composition and that. And after we go also in trends and technology, materials and some applicational examples, we start with a simple fact, what is uh, laser metal deposition or also laser cladding, which is at the end of the day, same technology. Well, we use um, metallical powders primary as a filler material to melt them on the surface and produce high quality coatings or 3D components, um, which might have some beneficial features and can, uh, let's say, help to protect surfaces in terms of rare corrosion or at the same time build new components of high level and high quality. An advantage of technologies, which we can also look on next slides, are related to the fact that you get metallurgical bonding with the substrate, means uh, you don't have any type of adhesion properties uh, in terms of failure. You get low dilution, which is very important in terms of mixing between the substrate material and your coating quality. Typically, we get um, below 5%. Also, the heat input is quite low, leading to the fact that uh, heat affected zone might be quite narrow or completely eliminated, depending in how you work. At the same time, we use lasers as an energy source, and this is an important fact uh, because laser technology has developed in the last years dramatically. Prices going down, laser powers are increasing, which all leads to also many changes within the laser additive and laser surface technologies in terms of like power, velocity, efficiency, and also economical aspects like uh, surface coverage rates. We're going to look on that in details and try to understand what were in latest highlights within letter metal deposition. Before we go there, I would like also to introduce um, Center of Competence, which I have a privilege to lead. 
We're rapidly growing, I would even call to a certain extent, a startup within our organization, where we are focusing on application development, materials qualification and industrialization of products for Erlicon. And everything is related to laser technology, not on the laser cladding or additive manufacturing. We also look on the laser surface ablation and surface texturing applications. We are well equipped having robotic systems, gantry systems, and at the same time also uh, rapidly and constantly increasing in new, let's say, CV production developments and also smaller cells which help us to focus on uh, process. We invest quite a lot also of our energy to get to state of the art of the technique, working with high power lasers, looking on IT guns, and quite a lot working with partners. You will mark uh, through my slides that uh, there will be some products shown from companies which I personally cooperate. Laser cladding um, market is quite still small compared, for example, to some other technologies. So people know each other and I also can recognize a couple of, um, let's say, names who will work quite a lot together. Happy to see you here as well. So um, let's take a look. Also, a short overview. Um, our, we have also a rapidly growing team. Right now, we have seven people within our organization, and we have also additional PhD students in cooperation with universities in Zurich, Munich, and also Aachen, who do not belong directly to the team, but also cooperate with us and drive the technology forward. So that was an introduction part. Let's go together and see what trends in technology are. Well, there is a typical standard slide, which I also show in last two years, not many things change here, but uh, this gives you an idea how the technology is growing and the progress is still taking place. And you, I mean, like if you interact with technology, you can see clearly three trends, which I would split to high speed applications, high power applications and additive technologies. If we talk about uh, high speed and high power differentiation for me is following. If I mean high power, I mean thick coatings and also working with extremely, um, let's say, big spots, uh, rectangular spots and also high power lasers, which go nowadays in direction up to 40 kilowatts. I know a couple of examples from production where people already work with over 20 kilowatts uh, rectangular spots producing cladding lines over 20 millimeter in width and working with up to 30 kilograms per hour material consumption, which is amazing number in terms of productivity and production of thick coatings. From another side, um, I would say six seven, year, six, seven years ago, the technology Ella, which is actually a German name translation to high speed laser cladding or extreme high speed laser cladding, um, has taken more and more attention, also developing in direction high power nowadays. But an important difference here, which I will also introduce in a couple of new uh, next slides, is related to the fact that we produce primary thin coatings. And in this case, I mean something between 100 to 250 microns per pass, but we have extremely high surface coverage rates, which go into direction five square meters per hour or even more. And additive technology, in my opinion, getting more and more attention in terms like high precision and more related process controls, melting path, dynamics control, artificial intelligence, all those uh, developments give us a possibility also not to only compete, but also to overtake certain applications from typical powder bed fusion. And uh, one of the highlights, what I believe also it goes into direction, for example, blue lasers as uh, the market trends also go on the direction how we can work with copper materials. So all that now in details, before we go there, I would like to mention one very important fact in my opinion that um, there is also a rapid development in direction powder nozzles. As we supply our material primary for work with powders through the nozzles, it's also very important to have an understanding how my working tool influences my quality, influences my process stability, and also has an impact uh, on the shapes I work with from one side and from another side on deposition efficiency. As uh, laser cladding was always something where people said we have high deposition efficiency. What does high deposition efficiency means? That we work with 90 plus 
percent of powder consumption which goes directly into your coating or component and we have a very low waste of uh, powder material which was always advantages. What you see on this slide is more or less related to how it was, for example, 10 years ago, we had um, multi-injection hole nozzles, um, which have different names, multi-axis or whatever. The most important we have uh, under certain angle, uh, certain amount of injection holes, which starts from three and can go into direction up to seven. If you see the nozzles on the market, they're quite a couple of, um, companies who deliver them to market and uh, some of them are very successful nowadays. You had also coaxial nozzle supply, which uh, always had a huge advantage of them, highest deposition efficiency, but uh, let's say lower working lifetimes. Um, everything started with so-called off-axis nozzles or lateral nozzles where you just had a powder supply not interacting with laser uh, before it interacts with surface and then if we talk about high power primary we talk about rectangular. There are quite of a um, let's say trend of development in the nozzles and um, I'm also very thankful to some companies who provided me quite a lot of interesting material. Here we have uh, for example nozzles which were developed not only for high speed but also for high power applications and um, what is the main uh, aspect of this type of nozzles if we talk about coaxials the extremely high deposition efficiency which we could also mark in certain cooperation projects and also possibility to work uh, under extremely high power if you think about um, let's say 20 kilowatts which um, have an additional cooling channels within the nozzle surviving under this type high conditions. Also what was also a surprise for me uh, the coaxial nozzles tilting angle has also changed and those type of nozzles nowadays can work um, also independent from uh, the position angle and some companies also go further and develop certain let's say as uh, tools and guns which can help you to access uh, very complex shapes and uh, um, let's say also work in certain dimensions and edges where typically you would not able to repair or let's say protect the surfaces which might be very important for applications for example in marine environment or any other type of applications. Um, I think that nozzles play a major role, especially if we talk about process stability, process quality, and the development trends going um, in that direction are really impressive. And what is most important, we're not talking only about university developments, we talk also about industrial products. There are a couple of companies who also do their nozzles. I see also Frank Beck as uh, one of the participants. His nozzles and BLC, especially multi-access nozzles, are also quite of high quality. Um, here I would like also to introduce a little bit deeper what type of nozzle developments go and why, what might be one of the directions. Um, this is a project in Aachen University and uh, together with DAB lab and uh, one good my friend, friend of mine, Stefan Koss, uh, was leading this type of project. So imagine working with um, complex substrates like cast irons. Typically, if you need to protect them from wear and use uh, metal matrix composites or other hard facings, it's very hard to avoid crack formations because cast iron itself is already very hard substrate to cooperate with. with. And at the same time, if you put hard coating, you really might get in troubles, so not in terms only of cracking, but also other defects. So typically nowadays how people work, they use some type of uh, buffer layer, which can provide you corrosion resistance, which is a ductile and which might be much easier way deposited to create cast iron as an example. And then you put a second layer, uh, which might have some uh, carbides in it and give you also wear protection. It's a well working process, however, there was a huge disadvantage in terms of uh, economical aspects because you need to put two layers which takes more time, more material consumption and uh, might cause you, um, let's say, troubles on the customer side as they just simply do not want to pay for it. So one of these motivations behind where is there any chance like working with special nozzles developments where you, for example, can 
take a look and produce so-called gradient structures where, for example, you can um, work with different uh, interaction angles of powder particles by the laser beam and as a result uh, produce uh, graded layers with one layer deposition having softer, let's say, layer on bottom and uh, then carbides on top. It was quite interesting to find out also that the first results going in that direction uh, help you to produce metamatrix composites. Uh, you can really very well recognize that uh, you still have those carbides uh, compared to two-layer system, but this is produced in one layer and also the cracks propagation at certain stage stops, which you, let's say then interacts as a buffer layer and uh, you get high quality coating with one layer deposition and also not having any environmental troubles in terms of corrosion. But, um, if you want to learn more about this type of project and nozzles, also feel free to reach to Stefan Kors directly, have interaction with him. He might explain it more deep in details. For me, it was more an intention to show that also special nozzle designs can help you to see uh, the whole process from a very different perspective. We move forward and um, what is high power? If you would ask me two years ago, I would say, yeah, I know a couple of lasers industrially working on 20 kilowatts, then uh, the world is not staying. We move forward and also this year in April, uh, for example, LaserLine has introduced uh, the high power cladding concepts where we they industrially sell 45 kilowatt lasers. There might be a discussion if you need a 45 kilowatt laser in terms of uh, production, but the fact you can have it if you find a way how to work with it and the powder deposition rates going up to 30 kg per hour of material in my opinion is extremely impressive, especially if you think about hydraulic rods where you need a certain thickness coating and you need, for example, one millimeter in canal, covering this type of surfaces with, um, let's say, high power laser might give you a lot of economical advantages. What is also surprising that the surface roughness is amazingly smooth and also for a laser cleaning process and also your interaction of melting bath with the substrate is pretty impressive so your dilution remains under five percent even working with this extremely high power lasers you still do not introduce too much heat to your surface and here are a couple of videos where you can see how the process takes place high power is also working not only with rectangular spot you can work with coaxial nozzles which also have extra cooling um, channels and um, to uh, over, overstay this type of heat input. You can also use inductive uh, surface local heating, for example, to even further increase your, um, let's say, feed rates and uh, surface covering possibilities. What is the so-called high-speed laser gliding or um, extreme high-speed laser cladding. The fact is here very simple. If you in conventional laser processes or laser metal deposition, you try to interact between laser beam and your filler material on the surface where you produce also your primary melting bath on the surface in terms of high-speed processes, you basically uh, put your primary energy in melting the powder before it interacts with the surface. So uh, the, it helps you to minimize even further energy input to the surface by also preheating your powder particles before they interact with the surface. And that helps you to get a lot of velocity to your components. Primarily, it started with rotation symmetrical bodies because it's easier to rotate certain cylinders. Um, and then you get thin coatings. And under thin coatings, I, as I said, I mean something between 100 to 150 microns on extremely fast deposition velocities which go to i mean like on a lab scale people try it even up to 500 meters per minute uh, typically if you look also on the last trending videos as for example for brake discs uh, the typical velocity is between 100 150 meters per minute bringing you a really high quality coating to the surface also for this you need special nozzles which can guarantee you a very smooth uh, powder flow and you also need a certain powder morphology which we're all going to look together in next slides. Um, there are a couple of another advantages if you work with a high speed process and uh, high deposition rates. First of all, 
your heat affected zone is even less compared to conventional laser cladding. Secondly, you have less interaction with the substrate, which helps you uh, if you have right uh, material also directly deposit one layer on, for example, hard substrates, uh, castings, gray castings. And last not least, your surface roughness is impressive. It's, uh, you can see on some pictures that we get in uh, really low roughness values, which if you familiar with thermal spray technology, uh, more or less, uh, um, let's say, have the same quality as you would get with HVF. And you can also move one step further. And by doing that, you, for example, can remelt the surface using the same process without interaction with powders. And what the main advantage you can get out of there, you just smooth the surface, taking certain asperities away or some puff stuck powder particles. And you basically, for certain applications, can completely avoid any type of uh, post-treatment if the surface quality of something like RA5 would be enough for you. I believe there is still a lot of work moving in that direction. And uh, we also recognize that uh, working in with laser surface remelting requires a, a process understanding and uh, development steps. But at the end of the day, you can get results which look pretty similar to this, and uh, it's impressive. Another highlight, uh, which was for me again, I've learned after discussions with again Stefan Kors, um, Working with aluminium substrates, especially thinking about lightweight, for example, bread discs or lightweight components, which require improved properties in terms of wear or corrosion protection. And I was always in an opinion that you can't put any type of iron, nickel or cobalt based material to an aluminium substrate due to extremely high melting temperature differences and also absorption coefficients differences, coefficient differences, sorry. Um, then working with a high speed process again and having even further adapt nozzles, which uh, take over 90% of energy in interaction with powders. At the university's level, at least it was able to deposit 316L directly on aluminum surface. And then you can also then interact with, uh, let's say, aluminum coated uh, uh, components by putting a meta matrix composite, for example. Quite an interesting approach, and uh, it's very impressive to see that you get metallurgical bonding and also very good quality adhesion between stainless steel and, for example, aluminum substrate. We move further. Imagine we just talked about high speed laser cladding in terms of interaction with uh, rotation symmetrical bodies. But if you would have a high cinematic, high precise parallel uh, system, which enable you to, let's say, accelerate components of free form and to do that on the velocities which we just learned by Ella. That would be meaning we can do 3D components using this technology. And that's where Ponticon comes in game, which enables with almost no heat input and extremely rapid deposition speeds produce you 3D geometries and additive manufacturing components with extremely high velocity. Um, I personally interact quite a lot with this process. In my opinion, it still require a lot of understanding of process, especially in terms you need special powder morphologies to be able to that. You need not only to control cinematic accesses, you need also very strong understanding in CAD CAM chain, how you can, uh, let's say, simulate and design components to be done by this type of process. But I believe there is a lot of future if you want to get, know, get to know more details about this process. Um, we also made with the CEO of Ponticon a very nice video on YouTube where we tried to explain what the features are. In my opinion, especially if we talk about thin wall components working with aluminum alloys or stainless steel alloys, uh, producing filigree features with high build rates, that might be considered as a future for many application fields replacing also conventional methods. Also think about that there is no heat affected zone, there's no gradient in terms of, um, let's say, heat input uh, to the surface. And uh, 
microstructure of 3D components looks pretty amazing. As I mentioned, we've done a very interesting video about this high-speed additive manufacturing approach together with Tobias. Please feel free to look at my YouTube channel, ask your comments, uh, and then we might have an interaction here. Just feel free to reach out to Tobias. Now we move more, as you see, to the direction of uh, DED, Directed Energy Deposition of Building 3D Components. Within our group, this is one of the major topics where we try to develop, not only from um, Matteo's point of view, where we have already rapidly growing portfolio within Metco at uh, products, but also from process understanding. And for me, there are four main directions which are very important for the DED development. For, uh, also considering the nozzles, let's say you need a really good understanding of CAD, CAD CAM chain in terms of process simulation. You need to have machines which allow you to produce large, large scale components because I mean, like if we talk about small and medium scale, you're in the competition was part of the bed, but large scale components or for example, um, repair of already existing components in terms of 3D repair on or building features on already simplified castings forms, um, this is where DED has an extreme advantage. Also, if we talk about gradient materials, where you can combine two, three different materials in one uh, part, that's where, in my opinion, again, um, laser cladding or in terms of 3D components construction is getting more attention. Material characterization, features of optimizing material properties, which we're going to also look more in details. It's a major factor. You want to have strength properties in terms of tensile strength, yield strength um, on a certain level, which uh, let's say do not differentiate from uh, bulk material. And that's why like uh, controlling of process and getting rid of porosity or cracking, uh, overheating of your material is of high importance. And finally, um, you also need uh, a process control, exactly how you can ensure your heat input to on many layer deposition is getting away from your components from one side and from another side, how you can ensure that you're uh, not overheating the components. So the process control or artificial intelligence is also of a high importance. There is a certain structure chain from design to strategy and production. This is just uh, again to uh, highlight how important it might be to have these all process steps if you want to do successful 3D parts manufacturing. And one of, um, let's say, aspects in design of 3D components, it's very important that you have a good CAD CAM software which helps you to work and also you have 3D models of your components of a high precision and with this type of, um, let's say, software, you can not only design um, the way and strategy of your deposition process, but also avoid mistakes, collisions, and um, which might typically happen in classical laser cladding process. Also repeatability, process strategy, and in most important, uh, the possibility to multiply what you've done between different uh, machines worldwide. It's also an important aspect. So if you design a component, produce it in one machine, then having all that knowledge and having all that processing steps, you can transfer it to a machine which stays, for example, in Australia and can repeat the same work on the same quality. Also here we try, for example, um, not only, let's say, working with the uh, Process simulations, we try to understand certain features. For example, if you work with gantry system, it's clear you have high precision. If you work with robotic systems, how you can ensure that the repeatability and the trajectory of accesses is the same as you would expect. So building mesh exoskeleton structures on the surface robo using robotic system is more complex if you do it with gantry systems. But with help of process simulations, with help of understanding of simple features, um, it might be also turned to a successful products formation. There is just a sneak peek of what we are, for example, now developing on, uh, on uh, let's say, beginning stages, but the results look quite promising. Um, 
Last not least, um, one of examples how you can work in terms of process control uh, are is related to infrared cameras. They are quite commonly used nowadays also for conventional laser cladding. None of laser hardening processes works without to measure your um, melting temperature within your laser spot. It's also not an expectation for DD. There are more and more, and which in my opinion, great uh, possibilities of process control going to market. One of the examples is by company Clamer, which helps you to avoid overheating of components, um, especially small scale components where heat input getting dramatic importance. You can build components which look much better, much stable, where the walls um, look more straight and you don't, uh, you don't get so much in the trouble. If we talk about even further large scale components, when you build the components of one meter, then the process control and ensure and to ensure that the melting path remains the same and you do not overheat of components getting more importance. I believe there should be one step further made in that direction in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of signal correlation between your working head, computer program, and also the movement of your accesses that you get a much better, um, let's say, control. Also, the path there is a high factor how you can differentiate the temperature uh, grad gradients which uh, might appear if you have always powder particles interacting with surface. Last not least, the DED development is related to blue lasers. And here, for example, company LaserLine recently introduced a three kilowatt device, which in my opinion is already getting an industrial attraction. I remember five years ago when we first were asked about, can you build a copper 3D components? That time there was only 800 watts or something laser available. It was still possible, however, and the running times were not economically attractive. Now we have it. So 2022, again, laser line introduced three kilowatt laser, which um, helps you to build 3D components using blue. Why it's so important that uh, if you work with pure copper, for example, you get extremely low absorption and with help to change in wavelength to blue one, you are able to increase uh, absorption factor by factor of 10 and with 3 kilowatts, which is absolutely enough for um, uh, building 3D components, you are able to achieve much better mature results, not in terms of only productivity, but also in terms of uh, high quality. What was a surprise if you work with conventional materials like uh, cobalt nickel alloys or even iron alloys, also there, uh, first results indicate that using the same process parameters with a blue type of energy source, you get um, higher deposition rates of around 15 to 20 percent increased uh, deposition rates at the same power level. You get more stable process and you can also better have uh, interaction with your materials and melting bath and as a result you get less porosity using uh, compared to infrared. infrared. Blue lasers are still quite expensive but uh, the advantages you get for for example working with copper based materials depending on your application and requirements have already certain advantage. So I hope it was interesting for you to look on the process developments. What are the latest trends? Now we move to material side of um, my presentation. In in the modern world, um, we see rapid requirement for new materials development. Why it is like that? You just uh, have seen that uh, there are a lot of developments in terms of uh, technology. So we have different way of interaction with powder particles with a laser beam being molten before interact with surface. We have high power applications where you need uh, 40 kilowatts. All that uh, so far was mostly reproduced with using commodity materials, commodity powder morphologies and PSDs, which were not necessarily developed for the new technological trends within laser cladding or any other technologies. So probably you also have a huge field which is still in my opinion open um, where new materials can take a niche and overtake for example in six to five from a market by increasing the hardness but maintaining the same level of corrosion resistance so um, there's a lot of work doing going in that direction 
However, at the same time, we need to understand that nowadays it's uh, with all the possibilities we have and billion of potential combinations of materials, um, it might take ages to develop a, a new material without having a, a possibility of rapid alloy development. And what is rapid alloy development within uh, early con as an example, we have a uh, focus on a big data production using our software, which is uh, helping us to model millions of alloys and at the same time to extremely reduce time required to produce um, new material uh, chemistries, which can then be uh, rapidly turned to a product. Um, so imagine having different alloying elements. We jump into material science of a high level in terms like complexity. But uh, playing with different alloying elements might take really ages if you want to test them all and uh, look on the microstructure features which you produce. And uh, however, working with big data and getting this very small answer required to, to let's say, have a feeling what exactly what exactly materials should look like, mm, you need certain speed. So imagine this chart shows you Let's take an example, Inconel 6 to 5. And um, within the chemistry of Inconel 6 to, uh, 6 to 5 range or microstructure range, um, you can have different possibilities uh, to impact on uh, toughness or, for example, abrasion resistant properties. And here, all the blue colored spots indicate and represent each individual alloy. So, like on only this chart, you have 150 spots which all might be an Inconel 6 to 5 microstructure, but with different toughness and uh, let's say wear resistant values. So imagine testing 150,000 different combinations, which is almost impossible. So uh, with down selecting um, possibilities of rapid early development, you just select from the chart like 20 chemistries, which can correspond to requirements you need and then Based on this, you can produce only like one to five powders, which go to rapid testing uh, using, for example, new technologies in terms of high speed, which really gives you a chance of fast testing of material properties and understanding if this um, type of chemistry might be turned to a product. This is true not only for, let's say, new materials development. This is also, to a certain extent, we have found out works for, let's say, commodity materials. Best example, if we talk about high-speed laser deposition of Stellite 6, first, we, we were very surprised when we found out that our chemistry morphology of powder uh, Metcos Sclat 6F, which was, a, uh, let's say, our classical Stellite 6 material for with a low, lower powder cut, suitable for high-speed laser cladding. We found out that we get uh, in trouble in, in terms of crack formation already at the first layer of deposition. And we start when we started to analyze, we found out that we get up to 700 vehicles in Stellite 6, which is extremely high number and which also results in cracking. By optimizing the powder properties on the requirements on ELA, you sacrifice a little on hardness, but you can maintain crack-free, producing better quality coating on surface. So um, using rapid alloy development, it's not only about new materials, it's also sometimes about changing of existing material futures and converting them to a product which can be used uh, for rapidly changing environment of technologies. Another example is uh, classical 1.4313 steel, which we have, let's say, strongly optimized in a one cooperation project here in Switzerland with Inspire, Empa, and ATH, uh, working on a large scale components. Mm, I would say this uh, type of, uh, let's say, engine block um, is over one meter in diameter. And here, um, the main target was always like, can you not only successfully and rapidly build it using DD technology, the second target was can you ensure that your microstructure features will correspond to the properties you would get with the bulk material. So that's how our new product Medco Ad has occurred based on a lot of testing and also morphology and powder properties optimization for additive technologies. And we have a product for powder weight fusion, fusion and also for DED. And what most important is that your strength and yield values are more or less comparable to the bulk. 
and you also get an increased hardness, which might have advantages in terms of uh, wear protection. What is also very important if you develop a new materials is that you have a full control on the microstructure features. And in my opinion, this is also a new word in terms of materials development. So we not only interact with hardness, uh, best example, um, if I need a corrosion protection, why not to maintain a ferritic type of matrix with a high chrome content, which is extremely corrosion resistant, and then to reinforce it with, for example, nano or submicro precipitation hardened carbides or carbobarides, which do not have a dramatic effect on your hardness values, uh, help you to keep the ferritic microstructure, do not uh, cause a multisitic transformation, and at the same time, extremely increase your wear resistance. And this is also one of aspects which uh, rapid alloy developing might have an advantage and help you to design materials and alloys from a different perspective. That's how we, for example, have launched two of new our products. One is an iron-based material, fully ferritic, to a competition to 400 series um, Martin Zitic stainless steels. And from another side, we simply made Metco 1720, which is nothing else than Inconel 6 to 5 microstructured higher hardness alloy, which um, let's say has the same salt spray results, but has a high hardness values and uh, overperforms even materials like Ultimate in terms of wear resistance and might be considered, for example, for marine environment and hydraulic rod applications. So going back to the modeling, uh, imagine 400 series stainless steels or martensitic stainless steels, depending on your process parameters, depending on your dilution and also initial composition of your material, because the nickel percentage might vary, chromium percentage might vary, after deposition, you may end up in ferritic environment, you may end up in martensite ferrite conditions, and this all might have a dramatic effect on your corrosion properties and also on your hardness properties. Typically, if you work with this type of 420 or 431, directly after laser cladding, deposition you are over 50 hrc which gives you quite a nice wear resistance but at the same time it has an impact on your corrosion properties so developing material which is also very important nickel free where nowadays it's uh, getting even higher importance you can design an alloy which no matter how you put your deposition process maintains a ferritic environment and at the same time the wear performance is done not by converting chrome to chromium carbides, it's done by um, precipitated hardened uh, fine grained uh, particles of, for example, titanium or niobium carbides, which are formed on grain boundaries and which ensure you get your desired wear protection. Also, our, let's say, testing results indicate if we do direct comparison of those materials uh, in terms of hardness. Uh, yeah. 1020, for example, really drops the hardness values compared to, as I mentioned before, 400 series steels. But in even simple ASTM G65, you get an extremely increased wear protection compared to both of those alloys. Another example, as the world is now getting more and more attention to brake discs, um, there is an early con solution for brake disc where, in the similar way, an iron based material was designed to. Uh, meet the requirements from automotive environment in terms of uh, wear resistance, corrosion resistance, and also um, in terms of in being deposited directly on raycast iron using high speed approach, um, having a very good surface quality, having a very good properties, no cracks, and at the same time can be in competition with typical carbide materials or double layer solutions, which were also introduced in similar presentations before. We also have already had quite a lot of bench test results, which indicate that this type of material development have certain advantages and can help uh, to make decision to a one layer solution also with not the hardest material. However, uh, also market requirements sometimes say, hey, I still would prefer to have a harder solution. Well, then um, we have possibility to reinforce this type of materials with, uh, for example, titanium carbides. And also here we do not need a bond or gra gra gradient structure formations as these material features uh, allow you to get up to 20% of titanium carbide, which is absolutely enough to increase your 
wear protection even further to interact with the surface with one layer deposition. Another example where rapid alloy developing has helped us to industrialize and qualify certain applications it can be related to wall seats, working with copper based material on aluminum substrates, um, for example, producing chromium free alloys um, and having microstructure features without cracking or intermetallic formations to a certain extent. And this is also one of uh, examples where rapid alloy developing can be used. Last not least, what I would like to introduce you, it's also a new high entropy alloy, which we have developed primarily for powder bed fusion, but then uh, the material properties were from beginning initially introduced the way that it can be also still used for DD. And for example, we need an improved steel, uh, improved strength, sorry, for let's say compared to austenitic stainless steel or standard duplex steels, which are very hard to be deposited. This type of high entropy alloys were developed. Um, there is a lot of papers in that direction. You would probably can uh, contact um, my friends from additive manufacturing who can tell you more in details, but what's most important, we tried this alloy also in DED application, producing, um, let's say, complex shapes and um, components, and we see there is no defects in terms of uh, porosity, cracking, very smooth, very beautiful um, deposition features of this type of material. So in my opinion, also working in this direction, like high entropy alloys, we certainly can change uh, an understanding of existing alloys on the market. Well, I believe it was a long talk from my side. I want very welcomely thank you for your attention. I hope it was interesting for you. From one side, uh, from another side, I would like to thank all the companies who agreed to provide me some slight information to show their latest products and developments. I believe um, it's always good to have many friends around the world and who can uh, support with slides. I also would like to help uh, our internal colleagues from um, IM and Scoperta Matthias Development Group. Uh, if you somehow planning to visit uh, Germany in um, November, there will be one of the biggest conferences related to additive manufacturing, also including DD. I will be present there the whole week. I am very warm, warmly welcome you to have an interaction with us, uh, have a talk. Maybe we can have some discussions also during the evening on a beer sessions, which definitely will be organized at our booth. And uh, at the end, I also would like to thank all my team members uh, for their hard work and it's really a privilege to work with this type of high level uh, worldwide or world class experts. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for the question session. Yeah, thank you Arkadi. That was really, really, really uh, extensive. Um, I thought maybe that you really we tried to squeeze in maybe everything in that in you I don't know learn in the past maybe five ten years in into uh, this maybe one hour of a presentation. Um, thank you. It was maybe really good. Um, now I mean, for people who joined us later, you can uh, post in your questions in uh, the Q and A section maybe here on uh, Teams. Um, I will read then the questions in the out loud and then Akadi will uh, immediately answer them. Yeah, so please in we put in your questions in the Q&A section here. Um, yeah, genau, while in people in we are typing um, to put in their questions in, let me start uh, and kick it off. Um, Basically, we have a few questions about in like in some uh, aspects uh, uh, that you, you mentioned that I found especially interesting. So um, with the um, high power laser cladding systems. So I remember, and we, I think they started all off with 500 um, um, watts, basically. Yeah, and we, like 10 or so and we years ago. Yeah, then it was in the six kilowatts, and it was in the standard a long time. Then it went in maybe to 12. Then in the 20, everyone said in the, oh my God, and we like, in the, how do you want to control it? Uh, is it in the not way too much? Aren't you burning holes in your material? And now you talk about 45 kilowatt lasers with a 30 kilogram per hour um, a throughput. Uh, I think of a nickel alloy it was. Um, can you maybe in the talk a little bit in the more about that? Are there already applications? Is it still in the, in the development stage? Um, 
Could you just say a bit more about that? It's a, a very good question, which I would I asked myself also a couple of times. Is there any applications between behind the 45 kilowatts? I personally know two or three companies who work with over 20 kilowatts high power rectangular spots. They started also this, for example, five, six years ago. They use, for example, laser line lasers for that applications and uh, they work with rectangular spot covering massive parts which have also a lot of weight and they produce over one millimeter, one millimeter plus coatings. If you consider high power developments also in direction of brake discs, they're a clearly trend, which was also, for example, introduced by Dr. Andreas Vank on one of your last sessions, uh, also going in direction 20 mm -hmm. kilowatt plus. They also use this high type of high power approach for brake disc in terms of covering the surface of this really donut profile of brake disc within 30 seconds, for example, because this is the only way you can get, you can meet economical requirements from automotive. So if you ask me, I highly believe there is a trend of working with up to 20 plus kilowatts. And there are certain applications which now try to prove that it's working and working stably. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Arkady, now I'm just trying to read in through the questions in that are now in the coming coming in. Um, there's maybe one uh, question from uh, Astrid. Um, what would be an acceptable porosity level for um, industrial applications? I notice also in some cracks you don't need, uh, you do not seem to be both uh, worried about uh, what is an acceptable level about crack length. So porosity um, and cracks, um, they they exist. Um, at what point do you start to worry about uh, porosity and cracks? Well, we always not have to forget that uh, laser deposition is still a welding process, not typical welding process, but we have the same physics behind as you get in laser welding. So if you work with hard materials, uh, due to residual stresses, they tend to crack. Harder you get, more cracks you can get. But the question is always, uh, are those cracks borrow you? Well, as long as they're perpendicular to surface, they stress relief cracking, and this does not have an impact on your wear resistant properties. However, if you work in an environment where you have a lot of corrosion, like hot gases or, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, chlorine, this might cause you under coating uh, corrosion and this might cause you aspiration. So if we talk about cracking. So in many industrial fields, uh, there is a clearly requirement to be crack free. However, in may also in other industrial fields, make an example, typical oil and gas stabilizers, steering pads, uh, ball valves, their laser cladding is used already for more than 20 years. They solve it again with a bond coat, like they put Inconel 6 to 5 as a buffer, and on top they put this 60% uh, volume tungsten carbide cracks. I've learned recently that some companies like Laser Bond can do this type of components without cracking with this extremely high level of carbides. This is one solution. Another solution used to bond coat. So this is working. Uh, porosity, we always have to differentiate. Typically, if we talk about uh, welding or even the casting process, if we have a porosity, it's so-called closed pore. So it does not really influence any type uh, of properties, except you really get uh, something wrong in your process parameters. Uh, if you have porosity in thermal spray, this is a porosity which goes through the whole coating and leads to, um, let's say, undercoating corrosion again. Within this type of technology, this type of uh, closed porosity is not impacting the process. However, if we go to additive manufacturing or building 3D components, if you have an increased level of porosity, this can directly impact your strength of material, and this has to be avoided. Thank you. Um, yeah, next question I'm going to read out from uh, Professor Chris Burnt. Um, he asked if you can address the deposition of ceramics rather than metals and composites. I didn't even know <laughs> that you can do that. Yeah, I don't know. Can, <laughs> can, 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 maybe, um, maybe there's some new developments. Maybe, can, you, can you talk about ceramics, laser cladding of ceramics? Well, uh, pure ceramics, I personally read a couple of papers where people pretend to say that they have done it and this is working. 
I have never seen something that on an industrial scale so far, but I mean, like, I'm always open to learn something new from my side. Um, however, uh, ceramic, to bring them to a melting and then extremely fast solidification without uh, embrittleness, uh, it's very hard. What we do is typical metal matrix composites where you can use ceramic particles as a reinforcement of your metallic matrix. And then in this case, this is working. Yeah, I, um, yeah, Th thanks for, for your answer, Envy Arkady. Um, I'm we have to scroll it back and forth. Um, you know, Colin, Colin has a question. Um, so for uh, DED, um, is there a way to deposit unsupported feature or is this a limitation compared with SLM powder bed systems? Um, so do you always breaking. need something to build mm -hmm. it up on that you then machine off or is there any way that you just build it up similar to an SLM powder bed system? That's a very good question, and this is exactly a limitation of this time freeform direct deposition process. Uh, you, you can, of course, to a small extent, build supporting uh, features, but uh, um, let's say working overhangs or building bridges is almost impossible. That's where we are limited. And I know the couple of approaches of if you work with wire deposition where people build step by step this type of uh, structures and uh, you can even see uh, this type of results on a couple of exhibitions and uh, make an example Pretetech, which uh, also many exhibition shows a ship built like that uh, looks very impressive however uh, on an industrial scale i can't barely name a lot of applications where mm. this type of complex structures were successfully applied yeah um People are also putting it now in the chat, so I'm also looking at the chat function now, what people would put in there. Um, what will be the difference between high speed and low speed cladding in terms of quality, in terms of coating quality? Is there a difference mm -hmm. in coating quality if you compare the high speed to, to low speed? Well, uh, quality, you first of all, you have surface quality differences because in conventional laser cladding, you really get these uh, wavy structures due to overlap and you need to take typically 300 microns of your coating away to get the post machine smooth surface. In terms of high speed, you barely recognize those waviness and you have to take 50 microns and you get the same surface coating quality uh, in terms of post machining. Then secondly, due to extremely differences in heat and boot, um, you get, um, for example, for stellitics, as I mentioned in my slants, uh, even high, high hardness values. Like, let's make an example. Uh, Stellite 6, if you do typical Micmac uh, process, you get something like 38 HRC. If you work with PTA, you jump up to 42, 45 HRC. Conventional laser cladding goes direction 48, 50. And with a high speed, you have up to 55 HRC. So you use the same material, but different deposition methods, and you end up with different hardness values, as an example. Then also heat affected zone is lower. So for certain extremely important uh, components where you completely want to avoid heat affected zone, this might also have an advantage. But uh, disadvantage would be that using this high speed approach, you are limited to a certain coating thickness, which for many applications might be not enough. So it's yeah, always to consider what is your. So exactly. What, 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 what do you want? Uh, and you trade maybe one thing in before the other. Um, uh, but let me also read that question here from uh, Zenith Engineering or Zenith Engineering. Um, what would be your solution? Um, when you have a high hardness material that uh, cracks, um, is it in the, then in the caused in the by preheating or by postheating? So you have in the very sensitive in the materials that are very sensitive to cracking. And you try to control it, but you rather do it by preheating or by post controlling the heat, the, 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 the uh, yeah, the, controlling the cool down. Both. Or post heating. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, May I make an example. We have in our yeah. portfolio material which is called 1030. It is a extremely high hardness iron-based alloy with carbon inside and uh, 
typically we get hardness values around 1050 vickers if you deposit it. And I know a couple of companies who have managed to deposit this material crack free. However, the process control is extremely preheating and also ensuring that your post uh, cooling conditions are completely controlled. Uh, only that way they were able to uh, achieve a crack free result. I personally have never managed to do that because within our lab we even don't have a possibility to do this type of extremely process control. Um, but uh, generally, if you have very sensitive materials, you need to have both under control. When make mm. typical uh, welding law, you have to be very cold or you have to be very hot to avoid this type of cracking. So very cold would probably not work for the for many applications, but very hot you have to ensure that you really have uh, preheating and extremely slow cooling conditions. But even in this case, the risk and probability of cracking in these high hardness alloys still remains. Yeah. yeah. I think there are just simply maybe some alloys where it's pretty pretty much impossible maybe to not have them to crack. Yeah, and then you put maybe your buffer layer in there for um, yeah certain applications where you don't uh, want to control that. Well, um, well, this is a classical classical solution. Um, booting and running with buffer layers because, uh, as I mentioned before, that sometimes cracks is not a negative effect as long as you need really only wear protection from a surface and its buffer layer is enough um, to have a stable running uh, process. Yeah. Um, gonna, Thomas S is asking a question. Um, where do you see the advantages of wire laser cladding versus uh, powder laser cladding? Oh, that's right, you didn't mention wires at all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I there reason. By, okay. <laughs> by, by, by purpose, because I mean, like, as, as you see, um, I needed to do uh, 45 minute slides and then the yeah. technology is growing so rapidly. So you yeah. can't barely cover all the topics and then you have to down yeah. select something. Um, sure, sure. For me. But, uh, uh, what, so what, what, what was your opinion about wire? What was the advantage or? Honestly, saying, I, I love wire cladding um, and uh, I see a couple of advantages. First of all, it's extremely high deposition efficiency. So if you have a stable running process, we talk about 100% of material consumption. And also in terms of environment, you do not have to deal with um, the, let's say, remaining powder particles. So economy, it's not only economical, but it's also environment process, uh, wire cladding. Sorry, it's a green technology. And um, secondly, working with uh, materials like titanium, where the oxidation might be a factor, there's definitely an advantage, and that's why many people work with what, titanium with wires uh, compared to powders. However, uh, if you see the deposition rates, especially for DED processes, uh, then um, powders have their advantages. Otherwise, many people would move to wires. Um, I mean, like it's it's like uh, sometimes comparing uh, Linux and uh, Windows. Um, people, some people would say wire has an advantage. Some would say powder has an advantage. I like to work with both, and I would uh, rather better go depending on what is my application behind, mm -hmm. uh, and then choose the right way of uh, let's manufacturing of components. Yeah. Um... Now, I mean, no, I'm just putting one question maybe from me in, uh, falling on that. Uh, many people maybe, that use or pushing the wire cladding technology, yeah, would say, maybe, oh, but it's maybe so much maybe, better for the operator because any powder thing we are so dangerous. Could you comment on that? <laughs> what is dangerous? I mean, like powder, um, powder, hand, hand not only powders. I understand, but uh, is it yeah. is it really like that? I mean, like, of course, if you take this powder particles in hands and do not follow safety rules, that might have a long term impact on, let's say, health of operators. However, if you have, um, for example, exhaust systems within your system installed, if you have a special uh, powder collector, uh, let's say, vessels, um, all this might avoid contact of people with powder particles. and. Uh, I don't see this this critical. Uh, looking on how we work and we work, honestly saying, 90% with powders rather than wires, uh, simply by the fact that it's um, a higher material choice sometimes. Hmm. 
And uh, there yep. is a big disadvantage if we talk about high speed, there is no way you can use virus for high speed processes. Yes. No, no, no. I, I was hoping uh, for such a comment. Yeah. Um, because in the discussions in that are uh, coming up always, yeah, that people in are very, very scared of working with powders for mm. some reason. Although the powders in were not in the invented in before additive manufacturing, no, they have been used in since, I don't know. A hundred years at least, probably. Um, it's all started with powder metallurgy as well, yeah? So it's quite uh, it did, widely yeah. used. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, if you have all the requirements and restrictions, I mean, like, what I would agree is that this nano uh, scale powders, they might be dangerous because there is no protection against uh, something which is on nano size. However, in typical, uh, let's say, classical hard facing process, we talk about relatively coarse particles, what we interact with. And uh, yep. those particles do not remain in air, as I mentioned before, if you have a nicely operating system with exhaust and powder collection, collection vessels. Yeah. Um, I found it very interesting Amy, to see that you are, um, the early con Medco has, you know, a high entropy alloy as a, uh, uh, as, as a commercial product. Yeah. Um, I think you mean, yeah, for 10 years or 10 years ago, people started in the first and we're talking about high entropy alloys. And now that here at Swinburne University, there's a lot of research in high entropy alloys for uh, um, applied via HVOF or uh, APS. Um, can you talk a little bit more about in the high entropy alloys, especially in the, when you apply them with uh, laser cladding? Honestly saying, I will be honest with you, I'm not an expert in high entropy alloys. It was also something new for me to learn. I see clearly advantages if you want to replace, for example, duplex steels, because uh, you always struggle if you want to deposit duplex steel uh, microstructure using this type of uh, technologies like laser cladding or DED. So this is for me exactly a possibility if you need properties which you typically get in bulk uh, duplex steel um, to get them out of a high entropy alloy. Okay, sorry for putting you on the spot there. No, 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 it's it's okay. <laughs> I, I I mean, like, I have also very lot of limitations uh, in terms of my knowledge. So I'm, yeah. as I said, I'm happy to also to learn new things. Yeah, um, the ASC training center in the team, um under which in the umbrella we are having in with this uh, seminar here, is uh, to train uh, PhDs in surface engineering and uh, making them industry ready. So I mean, these PhD students, in me, they are um, going to finish, yeah, have already finished, are going to finish soon. What do you think are the job prospects for um, newly graduated PhDs in uh, surface engineering? Um, in, in my opinion, but this is my personal opinion, that um, only the high qualified uh, people with uh, let's say, in terms of open mind, in terms that they still are not uh, blocked by also classical approaches, can drive and move technology forward. So I believe uh, there is a huge importance and need on the market for surface engineers who understand new processes, ready to learn and ready also to uh, push the technology um, forward. I mean, like for me, it was also not very much different when I was finishing my PhD almost uh, 10 years ago. Um, also to select because I mean, like, first what I, I had a chance, I went to a small job shop in Germany um, called Nutek. It was really extremely experience and I'm still very thankful to the people there. Um, the difference was always like, even if I were working in applied industrial conditions where we were interacting with industry quite a lot, uh, when you jump to production conditions, you really see this is completely different world. So um, I would say the possibility of being an engineer in surface treatment or tribology or even uh, welding processes, it's very important that you also jump to, uh, let's say, a production environment and learn what mm -hmm. the requirements are there, like yeah. uh, working on project costs, uh, working on delivery times, uh, ensuring quality, audits, those things which jump on you, which you don't really recognize as a scientist or working in a scientific environment, they might drive you a little bit, uh, let's crazy. You get shocked at the beginning, but it's a really great school 
of understanding and applying the knowledge you got from, in, uh, let's say, university on an industrial scale. Thank you so much, Akadi. I think Invi, that was Invi, a really great Invi, as a last Invi comment Invi, to wrap up the session here. Uh, I hope Invi, that Invi, everyone uh, enjoyed it, or I'm sure everyone Invi, enjoyed Invi, to uh, learn from you. Yeah, And uh, thanks to you, Akadi, for sharing uh, your experience. Um, I think Invi, that was uh, very valuable Invi, for the students and for the people and industry um, yeah, who are new to laser cladding or even for the experienced ones. Um, yeah, I'm sure Amy, I did, uh, didn't get Amy to read Amy, all the questions. Uh, if, if you have a burning question, um, I'm sure Amy Arkady is uh, happy to answer them uh, later when you send them via email or so. Um, yeah, thank you again. And I hope Amy, to see you here Amy, for another Amy Seam webinar in the uh, not too far future. Thank you. Thank you very much also from my side. As I mentioned before, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to get to interaction with me. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Sim, for this opportunity. It was fun. I hope you also learned something and uh, I have enjoyed it. Thank you.